as my father said decades ago, when a larger power rules a smaller nation, some form of violent resistance is to be expected. And as for my own family's brush with terrorism, in our case, it drove all of us to engage with the Palestinians and to reach out. And the same thing happened to me personally. And again, I want to quote a passage from my book, The General's Son. Then, in the fall of 1997, disaster. My niece Madar was killed by Palestinian suicide bombers in Jerusalem. Several hours later, there we were, driving along the road to the cemetery. Police escorted our procession on motorcycles, making way for vans, carrying the devastated family members of another Jewish casualty. As we got out of the van, someone approached and asked me to carry the small coffin. My heart felt far heavier than the heartbreakingly slight weight on my shoulders. Israelis and Palestinians, family members and friends, famous leaders and ordinary people, all came to give eulogies and to express their sorrow at this unspeakable loss. Smadar, my niece, was laid to rest near my father, her grandfather, in a small hilltop cemetery just outside Jerusalem. To this day, my sister Nareed cannot forgive herself for leaving her baby girl out alone in the cold, damp ground. But when my sister did come out to greet the mourners, the thousands who came to mourn, she did not ask for retaliation. She did not talk about revenge. The first words that came out of her mouth were these. No real mother would want the same horror to happen to another mother. And I, go, I quote again from the book. I stayed in Jerusalem for the week of the Shiva, the seven days of mourning. It wasn't easy to return home and, return, and resume my routines after it was over. How do people do this, I kept thinking to myself. How do people keep on living as though nothing had happened? How many songs have been sung, poems, poems read, and stories written about this feeling, the feeling one has when the unthinkable happens, yet the world doesn't end? It seemed pos impossible to carry on, but my mother always says that life was stronger than death, and so we went on. But something had changed. I knew I had to do something, and I knew that the right thing to do was to meet with Palestinians. And I did this right here in San Diego, and I was welcomed by the warm embrace of the local Palestinian community. The experience of meeting with Palestinians was comforting, it was liberating, and it was also heart-wrenchingly difficult. It was comforting to know that we're all very similar. And it was liberating to know that we don't have to be enemies. But it was heart-wrenchingly difficult to realize that I did not possess, I did not have full possession of the truth. And that is where I think Israeli supporters, mostly Jews, are, that's I think where most of them are. And I think it's time for Israeli, Israeli Jews and American Jews to join what was very eloquently described by Clovis Maksud as the constituency of conscience. You know, one can, only, one can only imagine what white South Africans went through when they saw that apartheid was coming to an end. Clearly they wanted to hold on to their way of life, corrupt as, corrupt as it may have been. The whites in the southern states were probably trying to hold on as much as they could when they saw the end of legalized segregation and discrimination and racism come to an end in this country. We see this with leaders in the Middle East right now, holding on to the last minute, not wanting to give up their way of life and their control. And Zionists in Israel around the world are now doing the same, trying to hold on. We see brutal tyrants everywhere these days, from Libya to the Gulf states, do the same thing, holding on even as they fall one by one. Now Zionists and their supporters do the same, holding on to the notion that a racist regime can last, that injustice and horror can last, and that crimes against others who are different can go unpunished. But we are near the end. The Zionist dream of an ethnically homogenous state was shattered by the Zionists themselves with their insatiable hunger for land. In their own hands, they created a binational state where almost half of the population are not Jewish or Israeli, but are Palestinian Arabs. 
true that they have no rights. It's true that they're not counted. But this will come to an end sooner than most people think. I think it's safe to say that the nonviolent resistance movement in Palestine will prevail. We have Israelis and Palestinians hand in hand, marching every single week in Bil'in, in Ne'elin, in Nabi Saleh, in Bet Umar, in Masara, in Sheikh Jarrah, in Silwan, and in other places. They face the brutal force of the Israeli army every single week, but they're dedicated and they will prevail. And the dedication of these people is the reason that people like myself who believe in justice and democracy are optimistic. In Nabi Saleh, another beautiful spot in the West Bank where settlers have made their ugly mark, Israeli reservists, clumsy and armed to the teeth, are, are faced with the undaunted courage of mothers and their children who just want the settlers and the army out of their villages and out of their lives. It seems surprising that Israeli soldiers, young men and women, who are raised on what is seemingly a democrat in a democratic society, are willing to enforce this brutal occupation. Because they do it very willingly, and they do it very brutally. But what we need to realize is that the Zionist education system taught these young men and women that Palestinian life is worthless. So for those people who do want to associate themselves with Israel and with Zionism and drape, them, and drape themselves in the Zionist flag, the flag that has come to symbolize intolerance, hate, racism, and brutality, they can feel free to do so. But they need to know this, that when the trials begin and the tribunals take their place, and when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission begins its work, and they're finally shamed into admitting that they were wrong, they need to remember to go down on their knees and beg forgiveness from the people they so blatantly wrong. Because they need to realize that we will never forget them and that their conscience will never allow them to forget that they supported the killing, they draped themselves in the flag, and they mocked the bereaved. The rest of us will move on and along with the rest of the Middle East, we will follow the example of the people of Egypt to create something that will surely be a tremendous accomplishment, a democratic, secular state in our shared homeland, a state where Muslims, Christians, and Jews live as equals and educate their children to love their diverse homeland with its multitude of, of cultures, its rich history, and its promising future. Quedaremos impunes ante esa mirada, cómo nos quedará regulando ante esta información que Mico Pelot externaliza desde eh, su lugar como escritor, el hijo del general, eh, un hombre criado en, en, en el seno de una familia eh, de militares israelíes que participaron en todas las guerras que conforman el hoy eh, todopoderoso Estado israelí, pero por otro lado también este replanteo que él hace esta mirada humanista, con quién se dialoga. ¿Hay palestinos justos para el Estado de Israel? ¿Se puede dialogar? ¿Se puede establecer una relación de Estado a Estado? Obviamente las pruebas pueden ser negadas. Obviamente todo lo que diga Mico Pelot puede ser desestimado. Pero los hechos son contundentes. Nos vamos a un rápido corte en Cartago y volvemos con nuestro segundo documental.